Last week, you know, we finished up the Zion series, and uh, I really sincerely ask and pray that you guys don't just skim through that. I may have gone at a certain speed, but honestly, I only gave you three points from Zion. Do you remember the last three from last week? Zion's defense, yes. What's that? Okay, it's all right. So the defense of Zion, right? Correct. Then we had the power of Eden. The power of Eden. Well done, brother. Thank you, sir. Carry with us. And they carry. The glory comes with us. And there are far more to Zion. So I'm asking you guys to study about Zion in your time. And you might go, what, what's so big? There, there's another one I can tell you very boldly. It says the Gentiles will come to Zion. I mean, people that don't know God will come to you because you're part of Zion. And people say, well, how do I make evangelism really good? How do I step up my ministry to touch people who don't know God? It specifically says in Zion, people will take your sleeve and say, bring me to Zion because God is there. Like, people want to know about your relationship with God. There's many verses about how the kings and queens of the earth will literally draw to Zion because of you being part of Zion. So I'm telling you, there's, there's so much more to it than what I said, but... I just really feel it was a good time to wrap it up and spend a lot of time on it. And I think it's good that we just roll on to some messages that God had given me over the weeks and whatnot. And again, I'm very encouraged to share that this morning. I want to say this. Usually my protocol is to kind of roll through the old message, and I used to give you a winning thought. You remember that? I kind of held off during the Zion series. But I do have one thought this morning. And the reason I get so excited about the winning thought is, during my week, God will plant something very odd in my mind. And he'll confirm it during the week. Y'all ever have that? Like a thought that God's like, is that really God? And then you have the oddest things that confirm it. So here's a word I want to give you. It's called repositioned. Y'all know what it means to be repositioned? How many of y'all played chess before? Anybody played chess? Y'all know the chess pieces? Yeah. King, queen, bishop, the, rook, the knight. And then, of course, you have the rook slash castle. Same difference. Rook, castle. Yeah, play chess, right? And then our lovely what? Pawn. Pawn. You know, I told a friend back there, I said, I'd rather be God's pawn than a king in this world. <laughs> and, the, and the pawn, I hope you laugh, it's awesome. And so the pawn is the only piece that can move forward and not backward, right? Every other piece has a luxury of moving backwards. But only the pawn can only move forward. As a matter of fact, it's very limited. But you know what happens when the pawn hits the end of the table? It can become whatever it wants, except the... King. Queen, she's like, oh, I'm the queen. <laughs> so it's all right. No, that's good. So I'm the only queen here. I like that. But it's all right. So you can't become the king. And that's really funny that you can think about a spiritual analogy that God had put in front of me that you can become what you want except the king. And you know what chess rules call that? You know what the rules of chess actually calls it? We wrote biblical talk here. Promotion. The Bible calls it a promotion of a pawn when you become something else, when it reaches the end. Now, here's my point, friends. When Jesus died on that cross and resurrected, and that stone got knocked out of the way, you were immediately repositioned in the full calling of Jesus. I mean, I understood that. Yeah. See, we want to treat ministry as I'm going to grow, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. One day, maybe I'll find out what God wants. You were immediately repositioned into the calling of God the minute he rose from that dead. Sin was forgiven. The price was paid. Hell's doors were closed, like we sang. And all of a sudden, the pawn is no longer the pawn. If anything, you've been transformed to what God wants you to be, which you know there's a multitude of choices that you can serve God with. And on top of that, the enemy who once had such power over you is now having to turn around. You know what Paul mean? Has to deal with somebody on the back. Remember the wars of Joshua? And Joshua said, surround them. And now they don't have a choice. They're surrounded. See, you are more dangerous to the enemy. But what does the, the, the enemy want you to become? What does he want you to believe? You're just a pawn, right? See, if I keep telling you you're a pawn, you'll have that pawn mindset for the rest of your life. And I blame some of this going on up front for telling people you're just people. No, wait, you are absolutely God's superpower. The question is, how do we make that happen? Is that all right? That's what we're doing every week. This is why I give you these thoughts, because I want you to really think differently about yourself. I really want you to see yourself not just some slave to Western culture, and I do this, and I do that, and I do this. I want you to think big. God is bigger than all our thoughts. I'm telling you, friends, he's way beyond you. But the sooner we get on God's plan, the better it will work. One last thought about that. Years ago, after God put that thought in my head, I got a pair of prescription glasses. And you know the frames have a little logo on the side? My logo was a little rook. You know what the castle is? 
You know what that means? The kingdom goes where I go, baby. <laughs> it is. I really do. I can bring it to you. I'll show you. My job pays for classes, right? So I picked it up, and after I got it, I was like, look at that. I have a castle on it. After I got it planted, this thought in my head. And then years ago, I'll just share one last thought. I had a dream. And it was a chessboard. And the king was Jesus, and he sat on a gold throne. And I was the pawn of there were other people involved. And I began to realize something. Jesus sits right there. When you sing about Revelation song, Jesus is already on the throne. He's not, people are like, oh, Jesus, don't fight my battle. He's actually sitting down next to God on the right hand. It's we who do the work. That's why Christianity is so confused. People just wait for God to work. I was like, I'm the king, dude. You're the, you're the guys on the front line. But the front lines are the first one, what? To really see battle, but at the same time, they get to see the work of God in their life. It's never a bad thing to be God's part. I hope y'all change your mind on that. All right, so that's my winning thoughts, soon to be on Amazon, and uh, it's all right. Good, so let's talk about this morning, and uh, I'm going to ask you a question, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to listen to the question very carefully, and here's what I need you to do. I want you to associate whatever thought that comes with it. Does that make sense? So the first reaction you have to my question, I want you to hold it, because you would be amazed how the Holy Spirit can grab things that you shut away. You understand? Like the Holy Spirit has a way of touching things in your life that you feel are done. And God's like, I'm not done with that. And I want to bring it back to life. How many understand that? You understand? So, again, the Holy Spirit works in this way. He wants to take things that have happened to you that you don't understand always with God and bring it back. And sometimes it happens with a question. So the title for this morning's message is my question. How many of you guys have ever experienced rejection? Rejection. All right? We've all kind of been there. But I want you to just remember, what, is, what does that bring to you? Like, whatever thought that is, just hold it, okay? Just don't let that go. You're going to need it today. So if you have a moment of rejection, whether pain or maybe me just blocking, blocking my brother's layup, that's good too. <laughs> I needed something. Mm -hmm. So we've all been there, come on. We've been there especially with God and certain things in our lives. And I mean, in all fairness, come on, guys. You know what it feels like? You get all dressed up, you look good, you bust out the cologne, you lock up, except for the special occasion. You come to church, she's sitting on this side, you've been eyeballing her for three months. After church, you kind of nervously walk by, your heart is pounding like a brick in a dryer. And you go over there and you're like, ah, hi, my name is Michael, I mean, would you like to go to Dominic mean, dinner sometime? And you know, she waits so long that the answer feels like two raptures have already come and gone. <laughs> And you're like, you're still here, and she's still there, everybody else is gone, you're just nervous. And so she gives you that answer, and you're just waiting for the last word to come. The first word to come out of my mouth, and she says, I'm waiting on God. <laughs> and you, you know, you're kind of like, excuse me, I asked God for three signs. You the sun rays that come out of the clouds, I got that. I got three green lights this morning, and two creamers from McDonald's. <laughs> I said, God, if that's what I get, she's going to say yes. And then she drops the, you know, the negative bomb, like, See, rejection hurts. But what I want to show you this morning is rejection is a very unique thing with God. And I want you to trust me that rejection is all over Scripture, but we have to understand why. So that's what we're going to do this morning. And again, I asked you this morning, what does rejection relate to you? And why did it happen? You know, what's going on with all this? We've got a lot to talk about. I'm going to ask you to be very patient. And uh, I promise you something's going to be very powerful coming out of this morning's message. So, everybody knows the story of Joseph, I trust. It starts in Genesis 37 and rolls all the way to the end of Genesis, Genesis chapter 50. If you have not read Genesis' story for Joseph, Joseph's story in Genesis, I'm going to ask you to read it again, especially after this message. If you've read it before, I'm going to ask you to read it again with this understanding. And the last thing I'm going to ask you to do after this message is please study it and make it work in your life. Okay, scripture, especially when you talk about historical verses like the book of Genesis, they're there for you. They're there for you to take something from it, gleaning, if you will, and take something in your life and say, what's going on with this? You know as well as I do when you're dealing with rejection, what's the first thing we usually do? We just shut that door, right? We just disconnect and we're gone. And what's tragic is when we're talking about rejection with God, we shut down the power of the Holy Spirit in our life in what he was doing. And we walk off going, well, God, I tried. Leave me alone now. I don't want to talk about it. 
See, rejection is very painful. And I'm not here to bring up an old hurt for you. What I'm asking you to do is say, what happened and why? And we're going to find out when we open the book of Genesis. Again, Genesis chapter 37 talks about a man named Israel. Now remember Israel? There's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name is also Israel. I don't have time to even explain all that to you this morning. Israel has 12 sons, which are also known as the 12 tribes of Jacob, right? 12 tribes of Israel. And the 11th son's name is Joseph. Now what's very unique about Joseph is he's highly favored by his dad because he was a son of his old age. But I want to just caution you real quickly. The Bible does not condone mistreating children or favoring one kid or another. Y'all okay with that? Mm -hmm. Sometimes with Scripture, we tend to think that because it's in the Bible, if some misguided friend of yours, I mean, so it was in Scripture, right? It's okay to have four wives. God didn't say that's okay. This is long before the law of Moses even happened. What I'm asking you, friends, is this. Remember the story. Jacob is Joseph's dad. And Joseph is highly favored. Remember the coat of many colors. But Joseph is different for another reason. What does he have? Two dreams. I'm going fast for a reason, friends. We have a lot to talk about. He had two dreams. Y'all remember the dreams? The first one, he said he was in the field with his brothers, the 11 brothers, and they had sheaves of wheat. Just think of wheat piled up in a little stack, a bunch of pull cues. And the 11 bowed down while his stands up. Then he had another dream. This time he said the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed to him. Now before we continue, what's very funny about Joseph is, who interprets those dreams? His, brother. his brothers and the dad. Not Joseph, because all oh, Joseph the dream interpreter. Ah, hold on. All these guys believe in dreams. From the beginning of the Bible, dreams were very important to God. But it didn't go so well for our dear Joseph. It didn't go so well. As a matter of fact, I want to ask you again, friends. Those dreams said what? The first one is the sheaves bowed down to Joseph. The stars and the sun and the moon, meaning his mom and dad, will bow down to him. I want to ask you a question. Look at me very carefully, okay? Just look at me very carefully. Where in that dream does it say he's about to be rejected by his family? You see, for many of you, you can get a prophecy or a vision or a dream. And you attempt to go down that road, or you expect something to happen. And when you come to that moment of truth, nothing happens, and you say what? Didn't work. Thank you. Bye. You understand that? See, the most painful truth of Joseph starts with this. The vision wasn't very specific about, or a dream, I should say, that he was going to have to get the boot. No one said that. No one said that. And for many of you dealing with these plans and visions that we got this hyper charismatic church, and you know what, God's not working, that, that didn't ever happen for me, I didn't see God move on my behalf, what do you do? Just keep walking past the trash, you, know, you kind of like a real subtle, and just keep walking. That's why I said this morning, the Holy Spirit wants to resurrect some of the things that you may have buried, and that Lazarus stone has to come out. It's got to go, and we're going to have to call it back. We have to call it back because God ain't done yet. Remember that? God's not done yet. He's not done. God's not done because something in Joseph's life and many of your lives are calling you to become greater, but there's a threshold, a gap in this journey, and that journey is painful. And some of us don't want to deal with that pain, and so we say, leave me alone. Matter of fact, Joseph could say like, oh man, I was a kid, bro. That wasn't a dream. I just jacked it with you. Because those guys probably look pretty angry. You said these aren't like boys. These are men looking at a boy saying, I'm going to kill you. That's, I mean, that's a problem. So he just could have said, ah, man, oh, dude, I was so joking, man. That's all right. Can I, can I wash your clothes? <laughs> but he chose to hold to that dream. Matter of fact, he said a second dream, right? He said he shared the second dream. He believed God for something. But what he didn't know was going to happen. And friends, none of y'all really know exactly what's going to happen. I'm saying that lovingly. No one exactly knows how the plan of God's going to unfold in their life. You just have to what? Like I said earlier, you have to believe God. And so when rejection comes your way, many of us say, man, you know what? This is stupid. And forget, forget the French, but like, you know, I'm just telling you what you feel like. And then we have the book of Joseph to guide us into what does that really mean? Now, I'm not trying to indoctrinate you into some painful life. Please no. But some of these people here know what I mean. And that's what I'm here for. Let's look very carefully. Again, I told you. 
This dream said nothing about rejection. But I want to have you say this. Would you mind saying this for me? Rejection can become a blessing. Can y'all say that? My rejection can become my blessing. Again, come on. My rejection can become my blessing. See, that's that stone you've been kicking off Lazarus' tomb for a while. You've got to kick it away. Because you're in charge. I can't really come around with a crowbar because nobody's really that honest with everybody. But you know what you're doing with your life. And you have to begin to say, this rejection will become a great blessing for me. And if that's you, then now we can get started. Let's go ahead and look at Genesis chapter 37 again, verse 18 and 19, if you don't mind. I know we've been going fast. So Genesis 27, sorry, 37, verse 18 19 will be up on the screen. It says, when those brothers saw Joseph coming their way, again, the dad had asked Joseph to check on the 11 when they were field, except for 10, actually, not Benjamin. But even before he came near them, they conspired. Look at his word, conspired against him to kill him. That's no ordinary discussion, friends. That's actually devilish. Verse 19, then they said to one another, look this what? A dreamer is coming. Verse 20, therefore come, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We will see what will become of his dreams. Just hold that thought. What's going to become of his dreams? Who are they really challenging? Uh, no. Thank you, man. Now it's time to hit the throttle. They're not challenging you when you're rejected. They're challenging the one who is talking to you. See, that's the first thing to help you overcome rejection. Many of us, when we begin to feel rejected, like, I did this for God, I'm serving God, and then bang, nothing happens, and you're like, this is stupid, I give up. It's not them challenging you. It's them saying, let's see what becomes of the one who spoke to you about that. Does that make sense? See, I'm going to say this lovingly. I don't really give a flip if people trash this church. I don't really care if people say we have nothing to do with you. Because I'm not dependent on a human's approval to make this work. Who am I dependent on? God. I'll just say that. Just to say that. I don't need a man to make the church work. Now, I love each of you guys. I'm grateful you've become part of it. But I want you to understand, if God has ordained me to do this, then I don't need to worry about rejection. Nor do you. I only say that for you to understand. I'm not saying for you to be disconnected or rude or obnoxious to people. I'm saying don't let rejection stop you from serving God. Because even the enemy says, oh, let's just see what becomes of what God told you. That's what they're saying. They're saying if you're such a dreamer, if you have such a plan of God, if God's giving you this, this vision or this heart, it will never work. As a matter of fact, we have another plan to make it not work. We're going to do what? We're going to get rid of you. We're going to shut you down. Do you think this heart of the devil has changed at all in 2018? No, so you have to think like the God of our Bible thinks. He's trying to teach you this has been the plan from the beginning. Do you know I've told so many people the same analogy? How hard is it to stop a fire? When it's a spark or when it's raging in the inferno? You want to hit the spark. They're trying to hit the spark by saying shut his dreams down. Some of you who have had dreams to serve God, you're like, oh, well, I mean, it didn't work. And so then you shut down. You can't do that. See, Joseph doesn't let that stop him. Was it painful? Yes, but what did I say? What is this rejection about to do? Note these words carefully. This rejection by his brothers has done two things. It's removed the power, the authority, and the support of man. And in place, it's given you the power, the authority, and the provision of God. You want me to say that again? When these brothers, the older brothers, the future leaders of Israel, give the boot to this man, Joseph, what Joseph had was the protection of men has now been replaced with what? God. You can fill in the blanks like an ad lib if you choose. When men disconnect from me, women or men, disconnect from me for leadership, authority, protection, supply, all these things, what does that leave a void for to happen now? It means God must fulfill it. Now, am I saying you break the law, God's going to bail you out of jail? I'm saying when you serve Jesus and you're rejected for his purpose and men begin to shut you down, God will just supply something in return. Do y'all understand me now? So this rejection was critical and pivotal for Joseph to come up and be promoted because he wasn't going to do it through men. Matter of fact, Jewish law doesn't say anything about the 11th boy. I mean, just, just saying. As the 11th boy, there's probably not a lot of opportunity for him to become this lead Wheatstock or sheep, as you want to remember, or the star. 
What are the odds? Nothing. So God removes man. Now, would you mind doing me a favor? Go back to that moment you were rejected. Is there a chance that God was removing something out of the way for you to rise up? Okay. Is there a chance or even the plan that God had to reject something out of your life for you to come into the fullness of God? And see, that means we have to embrace what God's doing. So let's do that together. Let's keep rolling. And again, this story is very, very tragic. As a matter of fact, this part, Joseph is hearing these men discuss his demise. Literally, they're discussing, oh, let's see how we're going to kill you. While he's a pit. I mean, it's terrible. That's why I said, read the story. I'm not even doing justice. But for the time's sake, you remember Reuben actually intercedes for him and says, let's just, so, remember, they try to say, hey, let's hold off, and they end up selling him. And some Ishmaelites come off, and where does he go? Egypt. To Potiphar's house, who happens to be captain of the guard. No order change, but again, Joseph is an alien, an immigrant, a slave, whatever you want to choose. He has no hope. Let's read the next chapter 2 over, chapter 39, and read verse 1 through 2. I want to show you something very powerful. Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Yes, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, a high position basically, an Egyptian, bought him from the Mishmaelites who had taken him down there. Look at verse 2. What's that? Say it up loud. The oh, Lord was with Joseph. Where does it say that in 37? Doesn't. As long as you're surrounded by men, it's very hard to hear the voice of God. But when everybody abandons you, all of a sudden, God makes it very clear. I'm right here. So you need that. You won't make it far in ministry if you think you're just going to become popular overnight. And if you do, praise God. Awesome. But if you don't, you might want to remember that. I don't need a man. You don't need a man or woman. Now, I'm not saying people can't be family. I'm not saying I said yourself. But do you know what I mean? I'm talking about this idea that God rejected you because you didn't make it the way you thought you would. And then to shut God out of his plans in your life. But this is why God gives us the Bible. Because he's making it very clear. The Lord was with Joseph. Now, you may insert that here. The Lord was with me. The Lord was you. The Lord was with her. The Lord was with him. On account of the rejection of mankind. Does it make sense? And guess what happens when the Lord's with you? You want to keep reading? He was what? Successful? Say what? He was successful and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. It actually continues in verse 3 and 4. Go and drop down to there. It says the master saw the Lord was with him and the Lord made what? All. Oh, I mean, he's, he's I mean, brushed in the back closet. It's prospering. He's feeding the cat. The cat gets big. I mean, he's getting big because he's lazy. But, thank you. And the Lord was with him and made all that he did to prosper his hand. What's up with Egyptians and cats anyways? That wasn't even me. <laughs> all right, let me get back to business. So, verse 4. Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. He made him overseer and everything he had was put under his authority. And finally, verse 5 sake, having been put under the authority, the Lord blessed the Egyptian house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and the field. Now get this, friends. I'm not trying to be rude about immigration or anything like that. But an immigrant servant comes to your house and suddenly you get promoted, a new job. You start seeing blessings. A new vehicle just pops up from Oprah and says, congratulations. Or Ellen or whoever it is. And stuff just starts blowing up. Your yard just has fruit trees that you never planted. And you're like, what's going on? And you see this dude in just rags cleaning the floor like, you. You're the one. Come here. You're now captain. You don't realize that's what it looks like. You think he's rich? He's broke. He's a servant. He probably said the same thing he wore on his way in. And suddenly everything's happening for this Egyptian man, Potiphar. So blatantly, he's willing to overlook the Egyptian tariffs and trade and customs and, and visas. L1, H1, R1, whatever, M1. And then he just throws all that away. Dude, you're number one in my house. Do you understand how nuts that is? Because the Lord was with him. Well, why was the Lord with him? Man had rejected him. So rejection even brings favor and prosperity in your life. Is that okay? Even promotion. I'm going to say this lovingly. There's only one at the top. I hate to say it. There's only one at the top. Now here's where it gets good, guys. See, I have a hidden office. Pastor, friend, and wingman. And so being a wingman with guys, I have to do my job duty. Now, y'all remember about the story about rejection by that girl turning you down? 
I say that was the biggest mistake she made. Look at verse 6, bro. <laughs> when the Lord is with you, verse 6, come on, give it to me. Verse 6 says specifically, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Now it drops that bomb. Because when Jesus is with you, you just smell good. That's right. Your swag comes in. You look at her. like these shoes. And he said, oh, I'm interested. I'm waiting on God. I got Jesus, baby. Oh, God's got my back. Come on back. Now, to the girls, God bless you. <laughs> All right. Good. It is true, friends, girls or guys. I don't have to say this kind of. Even the world acknowledges people who serve God. I'm telling you. I'm just trying to talk about my own life. You'd be amazed how much the world takes notice when you serve God. They want that. Don't let the world fool you. They like the idea that you have morals, that you love Jesus. They, don't, they can't feel the, the ability. Like they feel like they can't do it. But they're amazed at a man or girl. It does make you better looking. So, fair, fair point. Of course, the story doesn't end there. This woman who starts sitting on Joseph ends up accusing Joseph of adultery, as tragic as that is. And Potiphar rejects him and throws him in prison. So because this Joseph is rejected, how does this prison life look? Is he in the back? No. Nope. He immediately gets promoted up. Read again. Verse 20 and 21, the same chapter, Genesis 39. Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prison was confined. That means it's probably torturous. But the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. The reason says mercy, I'm telling you, I don't think they even got fed. The Lord showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. If you drop down verse 23 again, it says, Whatever Joseph did, prospered. Can I just rewind why this power is operating? What would you say about rejection? My rejection can become a powerful blessing. Even. I know you all said blessing, but it can become a powerful blessing. That's why I said I need you to connect to this. It's your job to connect it. Whatever the dots are for you, you have to make it a blessing. But your rejection is a great blessing with God's hand upon you. Time for sake, I'll speed up a little bit. So again, rolling into Genesis 41. Genesis 40 is a prisoner's dreams. Y'all remember that story? And in Genesis 41, the cupbearer who comes back to Pharaoh somehow forgot about his poor friend Joseph. And what does God do? God gives Pharaoh dreams. Why is that so important? Who in Egypt can interpret a dream? Only one man. See, what's very unique about that rejection is it begins to create a pathway for you. Uh, y'all didn't text that. You, I mean, really, y'all listen. Rejection creates a pathway outside of your eyes. Does Joseph know in prison that Pharaoh's having dreams? And he's got an advocate over in that Pharaoh's courtroom that says, I know a guy. Like, you know the movies? Like, I know a guy that can get you help. Like, I know a guy. I know a guy. And it's just what happens. This is the only guy who is Joseph. So many times when you deal with rejection, you're in this box. And you're like, man, I don't see anything. But outside of your scope, God is working on your behalf. And using people who aren't even Christian to help you achieve your plan. And so you all know the story. Pharaoh has two dreams about the seven cows and the bad weed. Wheat? I don't remember that. I've talked about it before. And so exactly, I know. It keeps me going. <laughs> Jesus, that's right. <laughs> so God keeps us going. And so the idea is he has these two dreams about seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, feast and famine. And so Joseph warns him saying, hey guys, we're a big problem. You need somebody to run this business. And Pharaoh's like, you're clearly the guy. And so immediately Joseph is promoted. And wherever he goes, they say, bow the knee. Jesus is the Lord. Do you understand that? Rejection that was so painful has created a master plan for God. Has created a master plan for God. And I know it hurts. I hate to go back there for some of you guys. But truth be told, God needed him there. And God needed something else. You know, very interestingly, as the story continues in Genesis, the famine is so rough that even the nation of Israel, those people there, the family, begin to suffer without food. And so dear Jacob says to his remaining ten sons plus Benjamin, hey, I need you to roll down to Egypt and go get me some food. And these guys don't really know what's about to happen, do they? They come in, 
They see Joseph. They don't know Joseph. It's a beautiful story, by the way. They see him, and they start asking for food, and Joseph's like, oh, I know you, and I know you. And it says he remembered his dreams, and they bowed to him. It's crazy. But for time's sake, y'all know the beauty of that story is real dramatic. At some point, Joseph reveals himself, and they are terrified. Because now, like, I thought you were killed before. Now I really know you're going to kill me. See, this is the worst part about rejection. Men use rejection to get vengeance. That's not God. What does God want? Look at Genesis chapter 45, verse 7 and 8. This is when God redeems you, when God promotes you. You do not take vengeance on those who hurt you. This is what you do. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Do you know these guys don't even know there's five more years? Joseph tells them, you have five more years, which means you're probably in the bed. You're not going to make it. I'm here to deliver you from a very tragic situation. And then look at verse 8, key on this very carefully. So that it was not what? You, you who rejected me. Mm -hmm. See, that's that's beyond humans. There is a thinking, the Bible says in Romans 11, that is so beyond human beings. It's only God. Look at it. See, Joseph gets it. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and a lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. He's not just showing with his medals like he's trying to prove to you something. He's saying, I can do what I say. I'm not just talking. You guys wanted to kill me and you had the power to do it. That's great. I have the power to what? Save you. Do you understand that? When he begins to explain his position in Egypt, I can take care of people who aren't even in this family. See, it's very hard to say, I want to borrow some money for a friend. It's easy to say for my mom, my dad, my children, I need some money. But say, some guy over there, in, I don't know, over here in this part of town, I need to get money. It's hard. But he says, I can do it. I can take care of you. And so the biggest plan of rejection is simply this. It's better to give than receive. When God begins to bless you through your rejection, that's not the blessing. The blessing is that you would use what God had done to you, whether the posterity, the promotion, the provision, and all these things God pours out on you to help those who what? Left you blind. See, that you can say that, you can hear me say it. You probably even want to say it yourself. But when your hands come to do it, it's hard. That's all I'm saying. It's hard. But God knows that. God knows that. And his heart is what equips us to do these things for those who have hurt us severely. How many of y'all understood all that? Good. i got some time. You know, it's very interesting about the story of Joseph. It doesn't really end there. He says this specifically. Chapter 50, verse 24 and 25, the end of the book. Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. In verse 25, Joseph took an oath from his children, saying, God will surely visit you. If you understand today's sermon, for God to move on Israel's behalf, what has to happen? Somebody has to be rejected. How does the book of Exodus, the very next chapter, start? A new pharaoh, sheriff, is in town. And he says, I don't really like you. What do they do to Israel? And slay them, beat them, and then start dropping their kids off. Not in a good way. Egypt begins to torture and torment and destroy Israel. Complete genocide, if you want to call it that. Just completely wipe them off the planet. So what does God do? He rejected my people, huh? I will raise up the man, Moses. And what's even more unique, whereas Joseph was an immigrant, an alien to Egypt, Moses is what? Adopted by the Pharaoh's own daughter. See, for Joseph, God, through rejection, instituted royalty. Do you know what Israel means? I remember... Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name is Israel. What does Israel mean? In Hebrew word for the prince of God. Anything that ends with E, L, L, E, it's God. So Michael, who's like God? Awesome, right? <laughs> Self-promotion. 
Israel means who, I'm sorry, the prince of God. So God has a royalty and his bloodline. And go figure, immediately Joseph is a royal man. So when they reject Israel, what happens next? Moses gets off right back in, in the world. Do you understand? So rejection is a very powerful blessing because this Pharaoh rejects Israel. And suddenly God's like, oh no, oh no. They're royalty. They're going right back to your house. This time they'll be your children. That was the plan of God. Now what's very unique about Moses' story in Exodus chapter 2, after he's been basically the king's son for some time, he goes to check on his people. He wants to check on the Hebrews. So he goes outside and he sees something very unique. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So Moses looks this way and that way. Okay? He, sees, he sees this Egyptian beating his own brother. Now he didn't have the rod of God, but what he did have is a Chuck Norris impartation. So he drops <laughs> one round half. And that guy's, I mean, look at that. How strong is Moses? Or, I mean, Chuck Norris, the rat house. Is, is, that's the all be all. Another Chuck Norris joke for you real quickly. Most of y'all have an email like, you know, Michael at Gmail. Chuck Norris is Gmail at ChuckNorris.com. <laughs> so, I mean, they can't even go you know, him. As a matter of fact, when he dials the wrong number, he says, you answered the wrong phone. <laughs> All right, that's enough Chuck Norris. Good, you're awake. Oh, man. So, this Moses goes and slays an Egyptian. And how do the Hebrew people respond? How do they respond? It says, look at this. And verse 14, chapter 2 of Exodus, verse 14, they said, Who made you a prince and judge over us? What did Israel do? Reject. So what's about to happen? I want just, please, I want you to take what you've been learning for this past 45 minutes or so, and I want you to apply it to Moses now. Please, you've got to grow. If men have rejected Moses as Savior, who has to operate through Moses? Uh, now you do it. You do it. Is that fair? Some of us go, how does God work through a man? How do I get power? Do I have to climb a mountain? Do I have to have something supernatural? Do I just dunk myself in oil? What is happening? The man Moses had authority, did he not? You know Esther's story? He could have done Esther, right? Come to the king. My people are there. You're beating them. Stop it. Correct, right? But his people rejected him. Esther was accepted by her people through Mordecai. So Moses was rejected, but then God says, go over here all the way to Mount Horeb, and I'm going to take you from Moses the man to Moses the man of God. See, I told you, rejection is about the nuttiest power because it doesn't make sense what is happening. It really doesn't. As a matter of fact, it cost Moses 40 years. They're hanging out in the back of sheep. That's a lot of rough conversation. So he probably does a bother me. But it's all right. So my point is, Moses becomes something very unique. But why? Why? Because the people of God said, who made you our deliverer? They reject Moses. Look at Acts chapter 7. Mr. Stephen explains it to us. Look at Acts chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, talking about Moses, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptians. Same story. For he supposed that his brethren would have what? Understood. They can't understand that God would have used him to deliver them, but they didn't understand. What's very unique about Joseph and his brothers is they did not understand from all their dream interpretation and from some of your encounters and your experiences and what I've spoken to you about, you don't always understand. And you make a decision, and then God doesn't work. And you say, what's the deal? What's the deal? You all follow that. They didn't understand. Verse 35, the same chapter of Acts 7 says this. This Moses whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and judge, is the one God, what's that? Sent. Do you know what the word apostle means? Sent. So God sent this superhero both to be ruler and deliverer. By the hand of an angel who appeared to him. Look at the next verse. This gets good. Y'all listen carefully. He brought them out after he showed signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea. Hold the thought. I want to show you how rejection operates. What did rejection do for Joseph? It instituted what? Royalty. Royalty. Israel means prince of God. What did 
Rejection Institute for Moses. Signs and wonders. When you're rejected by man, God institutes signs and wonders. Y'all believe that? How many of y'all remember Acts chapter 4? After Pentecost, they were laughed at. And then the church came and said, hey, y'all knock it off. And they prayed and said, Lord, now stretch out your hand to what? Come on, sister. Y'all stretch, God stretch out your hand to? Heal. Show it that God is with us. Signs and wonders when people are rejected. You have to remember that. You have to remember that. Good. Does it make sense to y'all? So we're, we're almost at that time where I usually shut it off. Y'all mind last story? I asked that as well. I'm not going to stop. <laughs> one last one. And it's actually the worst rejection in history. The greatest rejection in history has been running under like all these stories. Joseph said somebody was going to come get you. Moses said somebody's going to come get you. Read John chapter 1, verse 10, 11. The very apostle of love had to write this. It says in John chapter 1, verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Keep the framework they did not understand. Verse 11, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now y'all know why. They didn't understand. They didn't understand Joseph. They don't understand Moses, and they don't understand Jesus. Now, y'all should know something. Why is rejection a good thing? Because it removes the support of man, the approval, their fickle mindset. Their, I'm on the bandwagon this week until Yao quit the Rockets and it's all over. And now we have James Harden. Like, he just drops all that junk. And now you have Jesus. And he says, do I really need the approval of man? But yet, what do they do to him all the time? Who's your backup sheet? Where's your degree? I need to see this. I don't know if you went to, you know, this school of thought. Like, he didn't have any of that. Didn't stop him one bit. People come and go and say, prove it to us. Show us a sign. Didn't stop him a bit. Why? Because when he was rejected by man, who was with him always? God, right? God was always with him. He did not need the approval of man. And so here's the ultimate example of rejection. And yet did God, I'm sorry, Jesus fail in one task? Not one. Not one. Now you can read this and understand. Matthew 21, 42. Matthew 21, verse 42 says this. Jesus said to them, Have y'all never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become what? Chief. And this was the Lord's doing as marvelous. Sadly, I don't think a man alive understood that when that came out. Why is it marvelous? Throughout the history of Scripture, God allowed men to be rejected so that God can institute His will on earth. Now you understand the verse. Or at least I pray you do. Why is it marvelous to be rejected? Because rejection brings forth the very power and institution of God. Joseph instituted the royalty of God's people. Moses instituted the power and signs of wonder. Jesus brought what? The kingdom. Right? He brought the kingdom. He said, repent for thee. The kingdom is at hand. Do they believe him? Not at all. Does that stop God? Not at all. This Jesus Christ, his rejection was so brutal... He allowed himself to be crucified all the way to the end. And this crucifixion was so immense that it said, Now you've been so rejected by man. Philippians 2 says this, that at his very, what? Name, every knee shall bow. Now you understand that. He was rejected so bad that if you were to say the name Jesus Christ, having us bang. That's what you read in Revelations. Do y'all know that? Revelations 4 and 5? It said there's a throne with a rainbow and a lamb, and the minute they see him, we're on the ground. See, they get it. Humans are just arrogant. We're arrogant people by design because of sin. So when they see Jesus, Philippians 2, verse 9 11 says, God has promoted this man so that at the very name, Jesus Christ, Every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. And they'll force you. If you won't bow, I'm telling you, it's a bad idea. You will bow the name of Jesus Christ, and every tongue will confess that he is 
Lord. Why? He was rejected by man. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Rejection. One of the most uniquely amazing blessings there ever was. I'm going to ask my dear sister to sing a song before we go into communion. And this song really touches my heart every time I hear it. I play it quite often for me. It's a song that now if you understand the message and you sing it, you're going to see why it's a little bit challenging for us.